Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for session two of our training series, UN, using UN Biodiversity Lab to monitor the pulse of the planet. My name is Amber McCollum, and myself and Juan Torres Perez will be your RSET trainers today, along with our many other guest speakers from uh, the United Nations Development Program and others with the UN Biodiversity Lab team in their work. So today we have Annie Brunig, Oscar McDermott Long, Nicole DeSantis, and Dee Zhang with us. We are honored to have all of our partners here today and throughout the training series over these weeks. For this training, we have two types of sessions, our intermediate sessions, which will all be held here on the GoToWebinar platform, where you will use the same registration link to join. These sessions will consist of lectures and case study examples. The 1.5 hour intermediate sessions are held um, on April 14th, so we had that session last week, um, and today on April 21st, and then next week on the 28th. Note that for the intermediate sessions, we will present the same material each day in English, Spanish, and French. So please sign up for your language of choice. There are also two advanced labs, which will be held on April 27th and May 4th. They will be hosted by our UNBL team via Zoom with separate registrations. They will be given in English with simultaneous interpretation in French and Spanish. Unfortunately, the registration for these labs is already full, but you can check back after the course is over to find the materials from those labs. All of the course materials can be found on the RSET training website here. This includes the recordings of the sessions via links to our YouTube channel, the presentation materials, and eventually the link to the Google Form homework for the intermediate sessions. I also want to encourage you all to type in your questions into the chat box along the way, and we'll try to get to as many as possible at the end. We will also post your questions and answers on our website after the training. If we don't get to your question during the session, you can also email myself uh, or my colleagues Juan or Annie at our email addresses shown here. For all three of the intermediate sessions, we will have one follow-on homework that will be available on the course website. To receive credit for this homework, you must submit all answers via Google Forms by the deadline, which is Thursday, May 12th. The link to the homework will be available next week on April 28th. To receive a certificate of completion, you must attend all three live webinars and complete the homework. It takes some time to process these certificates, so you can expect to receive them about two months after the completion of the course. The UNBL team will also be issuing certificates of completion for each of their advanced labs. Each of these labs will require an assignment to be submitted to the UNBL team, and more details on the submission process and the certificates will be provided during those sessions. So here is a general overview of the intermediate sessions. Today, we will focus on exploring the UN Biodiversity Lab public platform. Then in the next part, we will explore the UN Biodiversity Lab secure workspaces. For the advanced labs, each with their own registration and approval process, the UNBL team will walk through a deep dive of the public platform in session one, and then a deep dive of the workspaces in session two. These labs will have hands-on exercises to guide you through using these functionalities. So this week, we will begin with an overview of the UN Biodiversity Lab. Then we will discuss the data and the various collections available to users. The team will then review the public platform functionalities, and we will have time at the end for any questions and answers. So now I'd like to hand it over to Annie Vernig, who will be providing an overview of the UN Biodiversity Lab. So over to you, Annie. Great, thank you, Amber, and hello again to everyone. It's a pleasure to be back with you again this week. So before we dive into today's training, I'll just give you a short refresh 
on our UN Biodiversity Lab platform that we introduced last week. This is just to make sure we're all on the same page before we dive deep into our data, data collections, and functionalities of the public platform. All right, so hopefully you all remember this, but in the most simple terms, UN Biodiversity Lab is a free open source platform that provides users with access to the best global spatial data and analytic tools. It doesn't require any GIS background to access or use. We created UNBL nearly four years ago specifically to support parties in their commitments to the Convention on Biological Diversity. With our initial launch, we challenged countries to double the number of maps between their fifth national report and their sixth national report and they succeeded. So building on this foundation, we've pivoted UN Biodiversity Lab 2.0 to support planning, implementation, and monitoring for the post-2020 global biodiversity framework, as well as related commitments and international agendas. We launched this new platform in October of last year at the Nature for Life Hub, and we're very excited to be offering this training for all of you, which is our first in-depth training on the new platform in multiple languages. So as we discussed last week, at the center of our redesign was really making UNBL more user-friendly and intuitive increasing access in multiple languages, and creating an API to drive seamless integration with other solutions. Last week, we went through to discuss all of our different key features on UN Biodiversity Lab and explore those that have been updated, those that are completely new, and those that have been expanded past our previous offering. You can see a recap of these features on this slide. Today, we'll be going through each of these different features in more detail to give you an understanding of what's available through the platform and how you can use it to support your work. So with that, I will wrap up this recap and hand it over to our next presenter. So here, I'll give the floor to my colleague, Oscar McDermott. Long from UNEP WCMC in Cambridge, who will give you an introduction to UN Biodiversity Lab data. Oscar, over to you. Thank you, uh, Annie. Um, so good afternoon or good evening, good morning, wherever you are in the world. Uh, it's my pleasure to speak to you today about the um, some of the data that UN Biodiversity Lab holds. Um, my name is Oscar McDermott Long. I am a senior data scientist at UNEP WCMC. Uh, I'm going to bring you through today some of the um, types of data that you can find on uh, UN Biodiversity Lab. And it would be remiss of me if I didn't start with the protected areas data sets that we host, um, given my affiliation with UNEP WCMC. So, the UN Biodiversity Lab currently hosts the World Database on Protected Areas, which is the largest database of protected areas on the planet. The data included are the legally defined protected area borders as reported by governments for both marine and terrestrial areas. All protected area data is pulled directly from UNEP WCMC in Cambridge, so the data on UN Biodiversity Lab is consistently updated as the WDPA is released each month. We also have data published in 2017 by scientists at the Joint Research Center uh, of the European Commission that has analyzed how well connected the protected area state is within ecoregions globally. For those of you familiar with this data, you may know it as the Protected Connected Data Set, or more likely PROCCON. So perhaps I should have started here with data on biodiversity, given the UN Biodiversity Lab. These are the core offerings of UN Biodiversity Lab. So first of all, we have the Biodiversity Intactness Index, which shows the modeled average abundance of originally present species in a grid cell as a percentage relative to their abundance in an intact ecosystem. It can be seen as a measure of how much humans have impacted on terrestrial biodiversity, 
or as a measure of how degraded biodiversity is in an area. We also offer recently released data from NASA on forest structural integrity and forest structural condition. These data sets can be used to identify the last of the best tropical forests. They are limited to tropical broadleaf biomes. We also host the KBA data set or key biodiversity areas, which are the most important places in the world for species and their habitat. Faced with a global environmental crisis, we need to focus our collective efforts on conserving the places that matter most. The KBA program supports identification, mapping, monitoring, and conservation of KBAs to help safeguard the most critical sites for nature on our planet. From rainforests to reefs, mountains to marshes, deserts to grasslands, and to the deepest parts of the ocean. Yes, I was made to say that. Um, so, we also, um, we also include several other products derived from the IUCN Red List range data that include species richness, threatened species richness, and metrics of range rarity based on the measure of species endemism. Also critical for drawing connections to SDGs are assessments of ecosystem services, such as carbon storage and sequestration. We include several recently available data sets on carbon, including this data set provides temporar uh, temporally consistent and harmonized global maps of above and below ground biomass carbon density for the years 2010 and at a 300 meter spatial resolution. The global soil organic carbon layer uh, allows for the estimation of sock stock or soil organic carbon stock from zero to 30 centimeters. It represents a key contribution to SDG indicator 15.3.1 which defines the area of degraded land. We host data describing land cover and ecosystem types as well. The first one being a data set that I'm sure everyone has heard of recently, which is the Esri 10 meter land cover data. This layer displays a global map of land use slash land cover change. And the map is derived from ESA Sentinel-2 imagery at 10 meter resolution. We, of course, include terrestrial ecoregions of the world. Note this is the update that was produced in 2017. And for those of you working on the Convention of Biological Diversity, this is one of the key data sets that are directly referred to in specific ACHI biodiversity target protection commitments. We also have the world ecosystems data at 250 meter global resolution. These data are able to show ecolog ecologically meaning differentiation between habitat types by accounting for a range of eco-physiographical variables, for example, precipitation, landform type, soil type, et cetera, et cetera. And if you look closely, you can see the difference in Uganda between these multivariate data sets and the eco-regions data, the black lines that you see, which is pretty cool. So let's talk a little bit about what we're calling social, economic, and human well-being data on UN Biodiversity Lab. This category includes data on human development, as well as ecosystem services, which play a critical role in linking nature and sustainable development. We host the city water maps. This data set contains information on water sources for 534 cities internationally. The watershed layer shown here includes information about the catchment area of the watershed that supplies these cities. We host crop suitability from 2011 to 2100 which shows general agricultural suitability considering rain-fed conditions and irrigation on currently irrigated areas. The data set covers two time periods, 2011 to 2040 and 2071 to 2100, as well as changes in agricultural suitability over two periods, 1981 to 2100 and 2011 to 2100. We host data on the gridded livestocks of the world, this data contains the global distribution of chickens, ducks, horses, goats, sheep, pig, cattle, and buffalo in 2010, expressed as the total number of animals per pixel. We also have the human footprint layer, which um, is the cumulative human impact on terrestrial ecosystems, along with the change maps of the human footprint layer as well. The human footprint layer is a global cumulative measure of humans' pressures on the landscape. We host Nature Maps Realize Clean Water Provision data set. 
which consists of globally normalized maps from zero to one of pixels ranked for their relative importance in delivering clean water to downstream beneficiaries. And finally, it's important to highlight that the UN Biodiversity Lab does not just offer data sets that are snapshot in time, but where possible, we offer time series data where, uh, where available. So the first of which is the annual tree cover loss. These data show forest change. Forest loss is defined as stand replacement disturbance or a change from forest to non-forest state. And the data on UN Biodiversity Lab are updated to the year 2020 at the moment. We also offer the MODIS data sets. These data sets include NASA MODIS derived enhanced vegetation index, normalized differentiation, a difference vegetation index, net primary production, and gross primary production. Data are also updated to 2020 and are at 250 meter resolution. So to see a full list of UN Biodiversity Lab data, please visit the link shown on the screen. Now that I've provided you with a bit of an oversight of the data we hold, I'd like to hear from you. What types of data are most relevant or interesting for your work? Please add your answer to the chat and I look forward to seeing the responses. And with that, I'll say thank you. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. It is such a pleasure to be here with all of you today. We've heard from Oscar about some of the data layers available on UNBL. I will build on this to explore our UNBL data collections, which bring multiple data layers together to explore how to generate insight for action. This slide of our core UNBL features probably looks familiar to you as, at this point. Oscar covered our first key feature, and I'll take you through number two, our data collections. We developed the UNBL data collections around several key thematic areas that you can see on this slide. These collections help users to identify data sets that can generate insight and inform action in response to key policy questions for conservation and development planning. Currently, two data collections are available, the Protected Areas Data Collection and the Nature-Based Solutions for Climate Change Data Collection. Two additional data collections are forthcoming, the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework Data Collection and the Restoration Data Collection. As new needs emerge in the future, we look forward to expanding and evolving our UNBL data collection. The UNBL collections can be accessed from the main UNBL website. At the home page, you scroll down to the section Discover, and from there you can access the two UNBL collections available one on nature-based solutions for climate change, and the other data collection for protected areas. Let's begin with a look at the protected areas data collection. This data collection examines aspects of protected areas and other area-based conservation measures, also known as OECM, that are essential instruments for protecting biodiversity and ecosystem services and can further support climate action and sustainable development objectives. When you navigate to the protected areas data collection, the page begins with a summary about this data collection, which defines protected areas and OECMs and the role of protected areas and OECMs in supporting achievement of the three real conventions. Next, there is a section on how to use this data collection. This data collection is a resource for planners and decision makers to identify opportunities for protected areas and OECMs to contribute to national biodiversity, climate change, and sustainable development priorities. It provides spatial insights that can respond to specific policy questions, such as where could protected areas secure key biodiversity areas, or where could protecting or conserving ecosystems enhance carbon sequestration? The following section presents three simple steps to explore the collection. First, you can browse the key policy questions provided below. Second, you can select a question of interest to view a description of the map available, the input data layers, and the policy relevance. And third, you can click view data to view a map that provides input to address the question. 
Let's walk through this process together to explore the protected areas data collection, starting with the single layers available. There are three policy questions for which single data layers can provide information. We will look at the first policy question. What is the extent and distribution of protected areas? This single data layer named protected areas is described as a map that presents protected areas within a given area showing both extent and distribution. You can further see the policy relevance of this question. Noted for the Convention on Biological Diversity, Target 3 of the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework. It further lists the included data layers, which in this case is the World Database on Protected Areas, as we are just looking at a single data layer. Next, you can click on View Data to see this data in a global map, which you can then use to click into specific countries and explore in more detail and depth at local levels. For this example, we'll, we will look at Costa Rica. On the left, you will see there is a UNBL country profile, which includes a summary of annual accumulated tree cover loss from 2001 to 2020. There is also a biodiversity impactness index, as well as uh, the carbon density for terrestrial areas, a breakdown of global land cover, a summary of protected areas from the WDCA, that is the layer that is currently shown on the map, and then the terrestrial human footprint. While this summary is currently showing the protected areas data layer, you could click on any of these layers in the country profile to show them on the map. If you click the side arrows, you can see the map more clearly and use the legend to see layer info, hide or remove layers, and explore aspects of the WDPA protected area data layer from WDPA all categories, which currently shows the different types of protected areas by color coding to just WDPA simple layers, and finally, a WDPA simple view on the map. Next, we will look at the protected areas data collection policy questions relevant for multiple data layers. Click on overlays of multiple data the layers to have the drop-down menu of questions appear. You can see here that there are a range of policy questions across impact ecosystems, ecosystem representativeness, key biodiversity areas, enhancing carbon sequestration, water security, forest cover change, and more. We will look at the first question, how intact are existing protected areas, and where could new protected areas preserve intact ecosystems? This has a policy relevance for the Convention on Biological Diversity and includes data layers from WDPA protected areas, the Biodiversity Intactness Index, and the Human Footprint. To view this overlay, click on View Data, which will take you back to the map. For this example, we will look at the Democratic Republic of the Congo. You can see the country profile on the left side, but we will minimize it to explore the multiple data layers in more detail on the map. So here, in addition to the WDPA map on protected areas, we can also explore the biodiversity intactness index layer and the human footprint layer. If we click on WDPA simple outline, you can use the legend to get layer info, hide or remove layers, and adjust the opacity of the layers to focus on aspects such as the biodiversity intactness index and human footprint, to identify areas such as ones outside of protected areas with high intactness index, and to measure direct human pressures on areas with the human footprint. The insights gathered from the protected areas data collection can help inform a broader view of the current areas of protection, the human pressures that impact ecosystem intactness and health, and the opportunities for informing policy and taking action to expand protected areas and conserved areas with the aim to secure priority areas, including intact areas, key biodiversity areas, and areas that are critical for carbon sequestration and water security. By identifying the relevant data layers to examine policy relevant questions, our hope is that this data collection can generate new insights that can inform action to protect and conserve essential areas. I do want to emphasize here that these policy relevant questions and associated data layers are provided for users to develop their own prioritization when designing protected area strategies. 
While global layers from the UNBL public platform are used here, users may want to consider using national data to create similar overlays via our UNBL workspaces. Next, we will look at the nature-based solutions for climate change data collection. This data collection explores potential actions to protect, sustainably manage, and restore ecosystems with benefits for biodiversity, climate change, and sustainable development. When you navigate to the NBS for climate change data collection, the page begins with a summary about this data collection, which recognizes that action to protect, restore, and sustainably manage nature can provide a third of the solution to mitigate climate change with additional benefits for biodiversity and sustainable development. A definition for nature-based solutions is also provided. Next, there is a section on how to use this data collection. This data collection is a resource for planners and decision makers to identify opportunities for nature-based solutions to contribute to national climate change, biodiversity, and sustainable development priorities and to support achievement of the three Rio conventions. It provides spatial insights that can respond to specific policy questions such as, where could sustainable forest management conserve carbon stocks? Or where could wetland restoration conserve high carbon stocks? The following section presents three simple steps to explore the collection. These are the same as the ones that we reviewed for the protected areas collection. Let's walk through that process together to explore the nature-based solutions data collection, starting with the single layers available. There are three policy questions for which single data layers can provide information. We will look at the first policy question, what is the density and distribution of above ground biomass carbon? This single data layer named biomass carbon is described as a map that prevents, presents above and below ground biomass carbon density showing extent and distribution. You can further see the policy relevance of this question noted for the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. It further lists the included layers, which in this case are the UNEP WCMC terrestrial carbon density, NASA above ground biomass carbon, NASA below ground biomass carbon, and NatureMap live biomass carbon density. Next, you can click on view data to see this data layer in a global map which you can then use to click specific countries and explore in more detail and depth at local levels. For this example, we will look at Colombia. On the left side, you'll see there is the UNBL country profile for Colombia, which we will minimize in order to review those layers. Here you can use the legend to get layer info, hide or remove layers, and adjust the opacity of the layers to focus on aspects such as the above ground or below ground biomass carbon density and the live biomass carbon density presented by NatureMap. Next, we will look at the nature-based solutions for climate change data collection policy questions relevant for multiple data layers. Click on overlays of multiple data layers to have the drop-down menu of questions appear. You can see there are a range of policy questions here across protecting, sustainably managing, and restoring ecosystems such as forests, mangroves, wetlands, marine and coastal ecosystems, and grasslands to conserve or recover high-carbon stocks. We will look at the seventh question, where could conservation and sustainable management of marine and coastal ecosystems conserve high carbon stocks? This has policy relevance for both the Convention on Biological Diversity and the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, and includes many layers relating to mangrove forests, sea grasses, corals, mangrove soil carbon, and patterns in marine sediment, carbon stocks, as well as marine priorities for carbon. To view this overlay, click on View Data, which will take you back to the map. For this example, we'll look at Indonesia. You can see the country profile on the left side, but we'll minimize it to explore the multiple data layers in more detail on the map. So here we can see the layers for mangrove forests, the global distribution of sea grasses, and warm water coral reefs, which can be adjusted for opacity, hidden, or removed. We can also see which areas have high mangrove soil carbon and the global patterns in marine sediment carbon drops in order to identify priority areas for sustainable management. The insights gathered from the nature-based solutions data collection can help identify potential priority areas for protecting, restoring, and conserving ecosystems with high carbon stocks in order to achieve climate change goals 
while providing additional biodiversity and sustainable development benefits. By identifying the relevant data layers to examine policy relevant questions, our hope is that this data collection can generate new insights that can inform action to protect, restore, and sustainably manage critical ecosystems. As with the protected areas collection, I do want to emphasize here that these policy relevant questions and associated data layers are provided for users to develop their own prioritization when pursuing nature-based solutions for climate change. Now that I've provided you with a bit of an overview of the data we have, I'd like to hear from you. What types of data collections would you like to see on UNBL in the future? Please add your answer to the question and answer box. I look forward to seeing your responses. With that, I will say thank you for joining us to share the UNBL data collections. We hope these data collections will be useful for you as you examine specific policy questions and spatial insights that can inform policy action. Hi everyone, I'm Dijan. Uh, I'm a spatial planning analyst with the NDP. It is such a pleasure to be here with all of you today. Here in this session, we want to guide you on how to use the public platform and the spatial data there. We have designed today's training to cover the main elements you may use, starting from registration and login to viewing and downloading the data sets. During the training, if you have your computer with you, please feel free to visit the platform by yourself or even testing some of the functions with my instructions. If not, no worries, there is other chances to practice. As introduced by Amber earlier, next week we have prepared an advanced lab where we will guide you through a few hand-on exercises. All right, now let's get started. Here on this slide, you can see the home page for the UN Biodiversity Lab, accessible at the above address, www.umbiodiversitylab.org. We currently offer five different languages, English, French, Spanish, and Portuguese, and Russian. You can select the language you prefer from the drop-down menu on the language tab here. Once all set, click on the data tab to enter the public platform. Then at the top right corner of this page, when you click on the account icon, there is also a language menu in case you want to switch the language. Now stay with me at the account icon. You will see a sign in option. Currently, I'm not signed in. What I can access here is to view the public platform data, but creating an UNBL account definitely gives you greater access to the data and some customizable functionalities. In particular, registered users are able to clip and download data from their area of interest. So to sign up, you just need to fill in some basic registration information and then when you click on sign up, you will receive an email for you to verify the account. After that, you will be able to log in and manage your profile. As you notice, once I log in my account, the left panel now looks different. I can access the workspaces I have joined. I can also create my own places collections here. In short, it's very simple to sign up on UNBL and we encourage all of you to do that. Once you have registered, you can search and visualize the data in a few very easy steps. Now let's explore how to search the data, visualize and customize your map view. All the data can either be accessed globally or view for a specific country. For this example, we will stay at the global level. First, click on the layers icon on the left panel to see a full list of layers available. If you know the name of the layer you're looking for, just type the title or keywords in the search box and the relevant layers will pop up. Alternatively, you can also expand the filters to select 
your subjects of interest. For example, if you want to explore all the layers related to biodiversity, just click on the checkbox and then you can view all the options we have. To load a layer on the map, click on the toggle bar to the right of the layer name, then the layer will show up on the map view. Click on the toggle again if you want to remove it. Sometimes we want to activate multiple layers to the map at the same time to compare or conduct overlay analysis. Here we also offer these little tools for you to adjust the overlay orders and opacity. For example, I now added both forest loss layer and the WDPA layer to view forest loss happened within protected areas. I am clicking on the dots icon to move the forest layer to the top and adjust its opacity to 60%, so it won't completely hide the boundary of the protected areas beneath. Besides that, there is also a small icon looks like an eye that you can uh, temporarily hide a layer on the map and also a cross icon to totally remove the layer from the map. Then we also have several options for you to customize the base map. First, you can toggle on and off the labels with, which shows the name of the places. And second, you can activate or hide the roads. When you zoom in, you can see more clearly. For example, I'm currently in Shanghai, and here's our dense road map. Last but not least, least, there are two background options, satellite images and the grayscale base map. You can find them all in the map control bar at the bottom left at the screen. Okay, about this, how to activate the global data and customize your map view on the UN Biodiversity Lab. As introduced earlier, all the data layers can be visualized specifically for your country and any areas of interest. In addition, we offer at a glance metrics based on the best available UN certified global spatial data set. As shown on this slide, we currently selected eight representative index, including forest, biodiversity, land cover, carbon, human footprint, et cetera, that can help report on the state and changes of nature in your country. To view and download these data sets, first you need to select your area of interest. Click on the places icon in the left menu bar, similar with searching the layers, you can directly type the name of your country in the search box. Or also you can use the filter to select any country's jurisdictions or transboundary areas of your interest. Once you selected your place of interest, click on it and the map will automatically zoom in to that place and calculate the eight dynamic metrics. Try to screw through and review the summarize the data and click show on map to activate the spatial layer. There you will get a better idea of where those changes occur. The distribution of protected areas in a country, the cities with highest human footprints, etc. And to know more about each data set, click on the information icon. There you will find a more detailed description of each data set, also including the links to the data source, the citation format, and so on. To download the metrics data on the left panel, you can click on the arrow icon next to it. And we offer both CSV and JSON format for these summarized statistics. They can be a very useful data source to reference for the country's state of nature. By this point, you should have an overview of how to access data and calculate dynamic metrics for your country. Finally, we will show you how to share the map view online, produce maps, and download spatial data from UN Biodiversity Lab.
Let's begin with sharing a map view. Once you have created a beautiful and informative map, if you want to share with your colleagues or link it in a report, while keeping the exact same places, layers, orders, and opacity you've set. All you need to do is to copy the URL displayed in your browser. Here you can see the URL has already recorded the name of the layers loaded, the opacity settings, and central coordination. With this link, anyone in the world would be able to see the same map view on UMBL just like yours. Personally, I think it's a really smart design and very useful for data sharing. I have also been using this function a lot. Then you might also want to produce a map from UNDL and use it as a figure in your report or other communication products. In the map view, we already help you set the basic map elements, including a legend, a skill bar, and a north arrow and we suggest you can use the screenshot function in your device with all the elements included to make the map you need. To add more about the mapping standards, well, try to make it as clear and concise as possible. Also, the important text, like um, the name of the layers, should all be legible. And it is necessary to use the correct citation so we can acknowledge the contributions of all the excellent data providers that made our work possible. Speaking more of the citation, to cite the map properly, first, remember to cite all the data sources shown on your map, including all the layers you activated, as well as the UN boundary map in the background. The full citation of the data can be found in the data information page that I showed earlier, and then, please also reference that the map is generated on the UN Biodiversity Lab, and please include our DOI here. Here are some example maps for your reference. If the map is intended to be standalone, you can reference the left example. And if the map is to be inserted as a figure in a report or a paper, you can reference the example on the right side of the slide. All this formatting guidance is on our supporting page and our user guidance menu, which we will share with all of you later. The final part of our training, also an essential function to cover here, is how to download the spatial layers. In most cases, you may need the raw data to conduct further analysis. And to do that, we have two options for you. The first option is to clip and download the layer directly on UNBL. If you only need the data for a specific area or just for your country, the most convenient way is to find this place of, of interest in places. Then click on the three dots on my screen, select clip and export layers. There you can download the raster data at the range of the place you selected. For geospatial data, please select the GeoTIF format and then click download to download the data uh, to your local server. And then the second option we have is for those who might need the full global cover data set we have provided the link to the original data provider in the data information page where you can uh, click download the data, go to the original website, and there you will be able to download the entire data set at a global range. Um, okay, about is our training today on the public platform. Uh, I hope that provides you the essential knowledge you need to get started. In case you need more guidance, I want to share our detailed guidance document that provides the written version of all the information I have shared today. It's available in all five languages. And next week, we have an advanced lab session where we will guide you through a few hand-on exercises. I will also be there live to answer all the questions you may have. Last but not least, another powerful function I have to mention is the UNBL Secure Workspaces. 
This will be our focus next week. And here is an overview slide as a spoiler. In the secure workspaces, you can upload and manage your own data and actually customize most of the features as mentioned today. So please join us next week to learn more. All right, and that's all I want to cover today. With that, I'll say thank you and hand it back to Amber. Thanks so much for those really fantastic presentations. Um, we're so glad to be here with the support of the full UN Biodiversity Lab Partnership, which includes colleagues from UNEP, UNEPWC, MC, UNDP, and CBD. Um, we're so excited um, to have you all and, and really appreciate these presentations. Um, I wanna make note here um, as a reminder Here's our contact information um, for um, my colleagues, um, as well as our, our colleagues with UNDP, um, if you need to follow up with any questions that we don't get to at the end of today's session. You can all also find all the information about this training, which includes the materials, the um, links to view the recordings after the sessions, and the Q&A documents on the website shown here. I also want to mention that RSET has uh, many, many other trainings available in uh, a variety of application areas like water resources, disasters, health and air quality, climate. So do please check out our additional trainings um, if you have interest in those areas as well. You can also follow us on Twitter um, for any updates on upcoming trainings or um, events. And I recommend checking out our sister programs within capacity building. We have DEVELOP, which is our internship program, and SEVERE, which is our international program. Um, so thanks again for being with us. We will now um, move on to the question and answer session. Thank you. Thanks again, everyone. Um, we're so excited to have hundreds of you from all over the world with us today. Um, now we'll move into the question and answer session. And we have a little bit more time than we did um, last week uh, for this. And now you can see that we have um, started to show the question and answer documents. Um, I want to encourage you all to continue to enter your questions into the Q&A. Um, I also want to make note that we will be answering as many questions as possible, um, but if we didn't get to your question or if you have additional questions you didn't think about, you can um, email myself or my colleagues Juan or Annie with our email addresses listed here. We will also be cataloging these questions and the answers and posting them to the RSET training website. Um, give us about a week or so to review the um, each session's um, question and answer document before we post them, but that will be made available to you all and it will be a really great uh, future resource. So um, we'll be getting to these um, as we can and posting the questions and the answers up to the site um, very shortly. So. Um, looks like we have a lot of great questions for the UNBL team here today. Um, so let's just go ahead and, and jump right in. Um, the first question is, what is the equation for the biodiversity intactness metric? Probably uh, should be me to answer this. So um, I hope the person who asked the question doesn't mind that I don't get into the nitty gritty of it right now. but. Um, as you can see here, it's effectively a model average abundance um, as a percentage relative to their abundance in the intact ecosystem. Uh, it's a lot more complicated that, than that. People a lot smarter than me have been involved in um, creating it. So I've linked the methodology within the answer here. So hopefully you can go away and have a look at the paper and kind of understand more about the uh, methodology used to create that layer. Great, thank you so much, Oscar. And I, I believe a lot of these questions will, will be for you today. So hopefully um, it won't be too overwhelming. <laughs> um, but yes, uh, thank you so much for providing the link. We, we often do that um, in these Q&A sessions where we can't really dive into the 
the depths of it, but um, we'll provide um, papers and resources as needed. And it looks like the second question is a similar um, uh, question. Um, is the biodiversity intactness data from the Newbold et al. 2016 paper, or has it been subsequently updated? So this, I'll answer this again, and actually I might at the same time answer one of the questions that are further down, which is a question that highlighted the fact that this data set has uh, in fact been updated in 2019. Um, however, the data set that we host currently on UN Biodiversity Lab is still the new bold paper data set as was highlighted in the question here. Um, the kind of the data set, the update in 2019 was around the kind of the methodology rather than being a temporal update or new new years included i think it was more around the methodology um of how how the metric was calculated and um, we currently do not host uh, the updated version but um we're always looking for suggestions of new data sets and it would be great if you could submit that as a potential new data set for us to assess and see whether we would like to host it on on UN biodiversity lab Great, thank you, Oscar. And maybe if we could scroll down to question six, I believe that's the question you were referring to um, that has a, a similar related uh, answer. Maybe we'll just look at that one briefly since we're on the topic. So, um, so the, this question asks on the topic of biodiversity intactness index, the PREDICTS data set is the Natural History Museum of London. Um, also allows us to download spatial data and country aggregates. Is this the same as the UNBL one? Um, and uh, the the Natural History Museum data set seems to be um, updated more recently, as you as you mentioned. Is there anything else you'd like to elaborate on there? Yeah, no. The only real update, uh, the only thing I might highlight is the kind of more detail about the methodology um, and the update of what that was. So the the ability to um, <clears throat> allow pressure effects to differ between islands and mainlands while also implementing some more sort of recent improvements in terms of the modeling. Um, to be honest, I don't know the data set hugely well, so I'd have to go and look at it in more detail um, when uh, if that was that data set was suggested as an improvement or something that needed to be host on UN Biodiversity Lab. Great, thank you so much, Oscar. So I think we'll then go back up to question three. That's where we were. Thank you, team. Um, so question three asks, any forestry, mining, and agricultural expansion data by 2030? I downloaded the urban expansion data, but couldn't find the others if they are available. Uh, me again. I feel like I'm the bearer of bad news today, but I am currently. I don't think we really actually host projections in relation to the expansion of the the, the, the data types that were mentioned here. Um, again, I'm going to reiterate that we're always looking for more suggestions. So please submit any data sets that you know of that might highlight these sort of data types to us, and we'll look at assessing them for their uh, their relevance for UN Biodiversity Lab. The other, the other thing to mention here, though, is that we do have the crop suitability and crop suitability change layers, which potentially could be used as a proxy for agricultural expansion. And um, basically, they should showcase the general change in agricultural suitability between 1981 to 2010, and more relevant to the question, perhaps 2071 to 2100, and their kind of um, one kilometre uh, resolution. Um, yeah. Fantastic. Uh, very cool. I was not aware of those um, crop suitability layers, so that's really interesting. Um, question four. Right now, only a few of the data can be calculated as country-level summaries. Will we be able to get country-level summaries of other data eventually? I mean, I didn't answer this question, but I can jump in if, if that's all right. Um, so essentially, yeah, we only offer eight representative indices for dynamic metrics currently, but in the future, we're hoping to expand these metrics to make sure that to be available for more specific uses, such as reporting global headline indicators for the post-2020 um, of the Convention on Biological Diversity or the Sustainable Development Goals. 
And we also are looking at the potential for offering more customizable metrics in the future as well as part of the kind of workspace functions that we provide. Great, thank you, Oscar. Uh, question five, um, what is the UNBL data that can be used for development of national adaptation plan development? Oscar, I can maybe jump in here on behalf of Nicole and then have you answer a little bit further. Um, but so this might be one where our data collection on nature-based solutions for climate change might be a good option for you to explore uh, data layers on UNBL that are relevant to climate adaptation. There, as you saw in Nicole's presentation, there are a number of policy relevant questions and data sets that you can access through that page. And Brock just dropped that link into the chat. Oscar, are there any particular individual layers that you'd highlight in addition to that data collection? Not particularly. I think you covered it, Annie. I think that's a, the kind of category of data that I would go and search within a UN Biodiversity Lab. I mean, the person who was asked the question probably knows uh, the type of data they're looking for a lot better than I am. Um, but um, yeah, I think you've covered what I would have suggested, Annie. Great. Thank you, Annie and Oscar. Okay, um, so we'll we'll skip along to question seven since we already talked about six. Um, so this question asks, how is the below ground carbon data obtained, and what does it include? Does it include all carbon stocks, namely fungi? So um, yeah, this is quite a specific question, um, and um, in terms of how the data set is kind of um, obtained. The data set, the data is available through the Oak Ridge National Lab Laboratory uh, dispute, uh, Distributed Active Archive Center. Um, effectively, the below uh, ground living biomass stock density of combined woody and herbaceous cover in 2010 is what this, um, this data set covers. Um, and interestingly, it includes carbon stored in living plant tissues that are located be uh, below the Earth's surface. Um, but it does not include dead or dislocated root tissue and does not include soil organic matter. So, um, and there's a link there in, in terms of trying to access the data directly. Um, so it, whether it includes fungi, I would have suggested it did in terms of uh, living plant tissue that are located below the Earth's uh, surface. Um, but uh, it would be worth going and having a look at the data, uh, the paper that goes alongside that data set to be um, to be more sure. Great, thank you, Oscar. Um, I also want to mention that Brock has been including some really great links to a lot of the resources that we've been mentioning through the um, answers to these questions in the chat. So um, you can access those directly there as well. So thank you, Brock, for including those. Okay, uh, question eight. Do any of the global data layers also show where there are likely significant gaps in the data? So um, currently, not to my knowledge, there aren't really any data sets that are highlighting this on UN Biodiversity Lab, at least. Um, I know that we have been looking at sort of um, how we can incorporate data uh, on kind of plant genetics and um, some of those data sets look at that sort of thing. But again, they're currently not yet at the stage where we're hosting them. Um, unfortunately, I think really a um, bit of a facetious answer, but it's more about understanding the data set that you're using in your analysis and really knowing and acknowledging the limitations of that data set. Great, thank you, Oscar. Yeah, very, very good point. We always try to um, talk about uh, pros and cons and limitations of data, especially when looking at um, global data. Um, so that's a really, really um, well taken point. Um, okay, uh, question nine. In addition to searching country by country to generate country specific stats, can users do batch downloads, for example, a spreadsheet with summary stats of multiple countries or for every country in the world? I think I can jump in here. Um, yes, it's uh, possible for registered users to create the collection of places within their workspace if they have um, an admin or owner's access. So when they collect the 
uh, when you create the place collections, they're able to view the dynamic, dynamic metrics for the entire collection and uh, the summarized statistics uh, as a table uh, where you can compare uh, the statistics among those places. And you can also download them as a summary table for the metric, uh, either as CSV or JSON format. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dee. Um, yeah, and I think we'll uh, be covering uh, those pieces um, in more depth with advanced labs as well. Um, so great. Question 10. Would it be possible to integrate migratory data with UNBL protected areas or the climate change data? Maybe, Dee, is this another one you could jump in and provide a little bit more details on? Do you want me to jump in, Annie? Um, I, th I can also do it as well. I think. Go for it, sorry. <laughs> just for, no, 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 just for some variety. I know we've been making you talk a lot. Um, so the short answer is yes. If you're looking to visualize the two data sets in tandem and look at, view them on UN Biodiversity Lab, you can load both of these layers and play around with the styling to make sure that you're able to view both of them. Um, we'll explore the various options for styling during our advanced lab next week. If you're interested in, in further data analysis, we recommend downloading both of these layers and doing your further analyses in uh, a desktop GIS. So you can see we've linked here, and I think Brock is dropping them into the chat. Thanks, Brock. Uh, our public platform user guidance also provides instructions on both of these elements. Great. Thank you, Annie. Moving on to question 12, is there a server to include in GIS software? And I'm not so, sure if we um, fully understand this question. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, yeah, I'm not ahead. sure. I, I'll uh, do my <laughs> best to kind of interpret it in the way I think it, what I think it means. I think it means do we offer sort of web services to access the data um, that we currently host on UN Biodiversity Lab? Um, if that's not the case, please kind of uh, feel free to highlight in the chat. But in answer to the question that I put forward there, um, unfortunately, no, the UN Biodiversity Lab, we don't kind of consider ourselves as a data producer. And that <clears throat> we currently rely extensively on our par partnerships with our data providers to share data that you see on the platform. And therefore, at the moment, we don't push data directly from the platform and we link back to the source of the data where possible. Makes sense. <clears throat> Great, thank you, Oscar. Okay, next question, um, 13. Are you able to insert your own polygon for calculating dynamic metrics? This links, I think, uh, in part to the, uh, the question that the um, uh, answered so well earlier. And the answer is yes, we offer the ability to upload polygons for an, any sort of area of interest in your own UN Biodiversity Lab workspaces. Um, that, that area of interest can then be used for calculating dynamic metrics. And we're going to uh, explore that further in session three of the intermediate training next week and our advanced lab on um, the 4th of May, lab one. Fantastic, thank you, Oscar. Um, question 14, uh, can we include climate change data in the time series data? So I can maybe jump in here. Um, D, if your audio, audio and speaker is working, you can also compliment uh, what I'm saying. So I think the answer to this question, we answered it on the assumption that you were hoping to include your own time series data. Um, so it is possible to add data sets that have multiple um, time points 
and we'll cover that in more detail as we explore the UN Biodiversity Lab workspaces next week, as well as in our second advanced lab. Um, if there is a particular climate change data with multiple time series that you're looking for that you would like for us to include on the public platform, we would welcome your suggestions. I think a lot of times, and Oscar can speak more to this, some of the climate data, raw climate data sets or climate prediction data sets are huge files. And previously we had stayed away from those and looked more for the biodiversity relevant or nature-based solutions relevant data layers for climate change. Uh, but that's something where Oscar, I think you have a lot more knowledge than me. So I'll, I'll pass it over to you to see if you have some additional uh, input. Yeah, I think um, the short answer is that we're beginning to realize a lot more of our potential in terms of being able to manage and handle some of these larger data sets. Um, so we're beginning to look at where we can start hosting these sort of data sets. So I don't really have a lot to add any other than that we're, we're always improving and always looking to increase uh, our, what we offer. Great, thank you, Amy and Oscar. Um, for the next question, um, for the data layers, is there a matching repository of past or existing efforts that have developed complementary information or data based on detailed on the ground observations? That's a, a, a difficult question to answer. Um, um, one which probably at, on the on the at the surface on UN Biodiversity Lab we don't kind of offer I guess any sort of um, crosswalk between um, other data repositories um, or anything at this stage. But I mean I know that we have um, done some research in terms of understanding what efforts have gone before us, and I think um, what we have highlighted is that we're always looking to. Um, like link back to the source of data sets so that those that are working on the sort of of the on ground on the ground as it was put here in the in the question those that are working on data sets at that level um get the acknowledgement that they deserve as well so it's we're not just we're not looking to kind of um uh monopolize uh the attention essentially great thank you okay uh question 16 so thanks for the amazing presentation, I agree. Um, I work for an initiative called Restore, if you've heard of them. We have a platform that also integrates some of these layers. Um, and a couple of them include potential and total organic carbon in the soil. I noticed that these are not included in the UN Biodiversity Lab, and maybe this is something <clears throat> that you would be interested in. Um, and then a uh, second question here, do you have plans to have carbon data for multiple time series? So in relation to the first question, we've absolutely heard of Restore and hello. Um, but um, yeah, in terms of the, the data layers, uh, layers that you've highlighted are not um, in your biodiversity lab at the moment, I believe those are actually data layers that have been submitted to us already that we've started looking at. Um, but uh, um, it's always good to suggest new layers, as you can see um, being put in the chat here via this form. So if we are missing data that you think would be useful for us to host, please do submit it to us and we will look at it. Um, and then do we have plans? Um, I mean, do we have plans for um, a time series of carbon data? Again, this is very much on um, the best available data. So when we see um, these, these, this sort of data available and its use for UN Biodiversity Lab, we'll absolutely look at incorporating it. Great, thank you. Okay, um, a few more questions coming in here. Um, looks like we were getting towards the end of the, the questions that came in prior to when we started the Q&A session here, um, but we'll try to answer them best we can on the fly. So uh, question 17, uh, can you add a report from an NGO as a point file to any given layer? 
Uh, unfortunately, I don't think that that functionality is currently available um, within your biodiversity lab. And maybe just to jump in there as well, if you could add a little bit more information into the chat about what functionality you're hoping to see there uh, with some examples, that would be very helpful for us to note down and to keep in our list of potential future functionalities. Great, yeah, thank you, Annie. Um, always looking to get that feedback, so um, good to hear. Uh, question 18, um, we've actually received this question uh, via email from some folks as well. Um, it says, is there any perspective of new sessions of the advanced labs to be opened in the future? And I know we've we've capped the advanced labs at 150 um, participants each um, because they are a more hands-on engaged um, environment, but I'll, I'll let our UNBL team respond to that question. Yeah, I can jump in here. Um, so we were pleasantly surprised by how much interest we we've had in the advanced labs we intentionally kept these small to make sure that um, oscar and d who will be guiding the sessions can can be able to respond to the questions of all of our participants so now that we have done this and are seeing all of this interest we'll definitely explore how we can make this available in the future um, either again in collaboration with NASA RCET or separately as the UN Biodiversity Lab partnership. So we'll explore this and make sure that um, all of our registrants for this series receive the information when that's available. Um, it looks like there's another comment below. We will make all of the materials from the advanced labs available on our course webpage. So the the sheets detailing all the exercises that we'll do as well as the recordings from the sessions will be available so that's also another way to follow along and we're happy to um, respond to any questions that you have feel free to send them to our support at unbiodiversitylab.org website or to any of the contact emails that are listed associated with the training Great, thank you, Annie. Yeah, and and as we do for all of our trainings, um, the links to the videos as well as all the materials are um, uh, on the training website into perpetuity as far as we know it. So um, they're always there as a resource for you to come back to, um, to reference, to um, work through um, any questions that you may have um, via the all of the recordings. So. Um, that's a really good point as well. Okay, question 19. Are the previous iterations of data layers available so that one can see the changes in, for example, how the forest biodiversity intactness index has changed over a certain time period? I think um, there's a bit of nuance to this question, really, um, because um, obviously we offer kind of with temporal data sets, the kind of the ability to see the difference between one year to the next. However, when the update of the data set is not necessarily a temporal update, as in the case of the um, biodiversity intactness index, where we're talking about a methodology change, as I know that there are aspects of it that are temporal, but we're talking about a methodology change between 2015 and 2019. I don't think we offer that ability to look at the differences at the moment. We offer, we we make the version that you're looking at very clear. So um, yes, in terms of time series data, but um, no, in terms of like com what we would consider separate data sets. That's a good point. Thank you, Oscar. Great. Um, I think question 20 is maybe a similar question to um, the one before about um, sort of connectivity to a um, GIS uh, platform. Um, is there anything else you all would like to add about um, the question, can we link your website to a GIS? No, I think as you indicate, I think it's a similar question to the one I answered earlier, and it is a case that we link back to the data providers where possible, and that we don't currently offer web services or APIs to pull data from. 
uh, UN Biodiversity Lab. Great. Yes, thank you for that clarification, Oscar. Um, okay, uh, question 21 um, that just came through. What is the coordinate system and projection of the downloaded data? This might be um, specific to each data set, but I'll let the um, UNBL team respond to that as they can. I think you've stolen my thunder. Yes, uh, it's very much <laughs> Sorry. to the, um, the data set that you're looking at and the kind of um, how that data set was provided by the uh, data provider. So unfortunately, I can't offer a uh, definitive, this is a one coordinate system answer. Makes sense, yes. Um, great. Uh, all right. Well, it looks like we have gotten to the majority of the questions as we see it currently. Um, we're happy to stay on for a couple more minutes to see if we get any um, others that come through. Um, while we sort of pause for a moment, I just um, again want to thank you all for being with us and, and for staying on um, through the Q&A session. I know um, a lot of you are still here with us, um, so we appreciate that. Um, I also want to give a plug for our next session um, next week at the same time for our intermediate sessions. And then as we mentioned, um, we have the two advanced labs for the lucky um, 150 who were able to sign up for and join those. Um, so looking forward to um, those as well. Um, Brock has also putting a few more links into um, the chat here, um, links to the UNBL newsletter and information about future trainings. Um, so if you're interested in becoming a more active member of this community and engaging with the UNBL team, do please um, take a look at those links. Um, and as I mentioned, we, we will also be going through um, sort of the answers here and cleaning anything up. and providing this document on the website for um, reference as well. I know the team has provided a lot of great resources and links to papers um, in response to these questions. So um, we'll be adding that as well. Um, so it looks like we got through most of the questions today. Um, sort of a rare thing for the, the RSET trainings where we have um, so many folks online from, um, from around the world. But I just want to thank um, our, our guest speakers today. Um, thank Annie and Oscar and Dee for responding to many of these questions and taking the time to provide really thorough answers here. Um, so um, I hope you all have a great rest of your morning, day, evening, night. And um, we look forward to seeing you online for our final intermediate session and for some of you uh, with the um, advanced sessions one and two. So thanks again, everyone, and have a great day.